I'm here today with uh, Jerry Vanneker, and uh, Jerry's the COO of the Detroit Zoological Society. How are you doing today, Jerry? I'm doing wonderful. How are you, Chris? I'm doing great. I, uh, I'm excited to have you here. It's, uh, you're my first guest from Detroit, uh, so I always love uh, when we get a new city and, and get a chance to ask, you know, how are things are going in Detroit? Well, things are going really well in Detroit. Um, yeah, I've got the uh, distinction of being the first Marriott manager that worked in Detroit. And uh, I think uh, now there's probably upwards of 50 Marriott hotels here. And, um, uh, you know, but that was back in 1984. And uh, I, I was the uh, controller at the airport hotel at the Detroit Metro Airport. Wow. Okay. So first manager for Marriott in Detroit. That is a, uh, that is a milestone. There's only a handful of people that can they could ever say that about any city. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so, you know, first manager, uh, uh, Detroit, uh, with Marriott, you know, how did you get from, from there to, to COO at the, at the Detroit Zoological Society? What, you know, well, the, the high level of that? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a really a great journey. I started out, I finished at Michigan state, uh, university in accounting, go green <laughs> and, uh, got hired in with a small, uh, hotel company at the time in 1983, it was Marriott hotels. Uh, they had 72 properties, and uh, the lady on the on the phone said, uh, uh, "Are you standing up, and do you like pigs?" And I said, "Yeah, yes to both, you know." And uh, she said, "Good, because you're going to Des Moines, Iowa." So I was in Des Moines, Iowa, for about a year, and that was back when, if you worked for Marriott, it was kind of like the army. You took your orders and you packed up and you went. And uh, I was there. For just a year and then uh, they took a hotel over at the airport in Detroit, uh, the host hotel. And so I went there for about a year and a half and uh, did really well and went to South Bend, Indiana and uh, ran the accounting office there for about 18 months and back to Detroit. I opened the uh, Dearborn Inn, which was undergoing a renovation, $30 million redo by Ford Motor. And uh, after that, I took a job downtown in Detroit at the courtyard as general manager there, and then several operations positions. So uh, I guess about 28 years later, uh, I got a phone call. It was actually from my boss, and he asked me if uh, I'd be interested in a different job. And I said, yeah, sure, Bob, what's that? Uh, the zoo's looking for a chief operating officer. And at first I was like, eh, that's kind of strange, you know? But uh, after a few interviews and um, a few months, uh, the zoo hired me to be their chief operating officer. And I, I think what's really been incredible, and I'll tell your listeners this, is you don't realize the skill set you acquire by running hotels or being in the hospitality industry overall, for that matter. Uh, you're really, you know, you're, you're, you're learning about customers, you're learning about employees, you're definitely learning about financials. And um, you also learn a lot about marketing and, and what the community is like. And um, most people too do quite a bit of capital investment and they oversee construction. So uh, the skill set that I acquired in the hotel business just matched up perfectly in the zoo business. But, but who'd have thought, right? So it doesn't seem like it when you're in the weeds, does it? You know, it doesn't seem no. like it when you're in the operation. But then when you take a step back and you realize, uh, you know, you've got almost every transferable skill that anybody who runs a people business does. It's it's pretty impressive. Yeah. And um, that happens when you step back or when you make a change. And that's why, you know, making a change in, in business now is really to your advantage because you don't know what you don't know and you don't know what you do know. So uh, when you get in that other job and you, you know, all of a sudden you're doing statement reviews and you remember, oh gosh, we, we did this back at Marriott and we were really good at it. And, uh, you know, there's so many organizations out there that just don't do things as well as we do in the hospitality business because, you know, the margins are so tight and, um, you know, the employees and the guest service and all those issues that, that come up in the business are so uh, incredible learning tools. Absolutely. I, you know, I could probably talk about this all day because I think this is, uh, this is one of those interesting topics where, uh, you know, you, you want people to be 
excited about the hospitality industry and, and to grow in the hospitality industry. But I think you also have to be able to provide people with an understanding of, you know, after you've come in, you've, you've gotten to a point where you're excited, you, you enjoy the industry, that there is actually life outside of the industry as well, right? I mean, right. I, I know when you're in it, it doesn't seem like that. But, you know, a lot of times you, you can grow stronger as a leader, grow stronger uh, uh, you know, a, a, as a person, you know, your, your business skills grow uh, immensely when you pivot and maybe yeah. come back. But I mean, it's, it's a, it's a great way to be able to test yourself. Well, and it's a matter of taking opportunities. You know, I didn't grow up thinking I was going to run a zoo. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought, you know, right. but, um, the, the, the transfer of the skills and going into the non not-for-profit arena, uh, has been just fascinating. And, um, you know, running hotels is great, but it kind of gets to the point after I was at 13 hotels that maybe, you know, I wasn't going to learn a whole lot more or um, push myself much more by going to another hotel like I have by going into the nonprofit arena, you know, where there's mission work and uh, community work more and um, availability of, for grants and, and things of that nature. Absolutely. I, that's fascinating and i think you're you're spot on because i mean it's that it's that extra challenge right you know yeah, for anybody for no matter what you do inside or outside of life i mean it, you get to a point where you plateau and you got to figure out what that next challenge is going to look like yeah you know and that kind of um brings me to maybe a, a point that we could talk about chris and that's the work that i did in sustainability at the zoo um you know sustainability is is so important to um to the globe right now and to to humans and uh, you know what we were able to do at the zoo is really work on some pet projects that uh, we were able to de to develop and then educate the community on what you can do at home so it's not only you know this is what the zoo does but it's more this is what the, the zoo does and now um, try to do something similar at home and I, I'll give an example I built an uh, anaerobic digester at the zoo and um, for those of your listeners that aren't familiar with that, uh, basically you take anything that has energy left in it mm -hmm. and you put it in a digester that uh, kind of replicates the, the most efficient digester in the world, the human body, right? Mm. So you, you take food in and um, uh, every once in a while, there's some methane that comes out and, uh, and then a byproduct. But uh, we do the same thing in the digester. We replicate um, a closed system and um, the methane we capture that powers a generator. And then the byproduct, the compost, uh, we use in our gardens and, uh, and actually sell some of it too. So, um, so all the waste from the animals uh, goes in, the food waste from uh, all the concessions goes in, uh, any bedding materials go in. And we're able to power uh, the animal hospital uh, with the energy that we capture. So, um, but back to my point about what can you do at home? Um, our, our, our guests then, we teach them how to compost, you know, and put that little stainless steel container on your counter and put your vegetable scraps in there and your coffee grinds and those types of things, and then take it out back and um, compost it so you can use it on your, on your gardens. So that's outstanding. Yeah. I mean, the uh, sustainability is a huge uh, focus for people everywhere right now. I mean, and I know that, uh, uh, you know, resources are, are getting more expensive. Everybody knows that. Right. Um, so if, if you can, if you can, you know, basically use everything you possibly can out of your resources and be able to turn it into another resource, obviously that's huge, both, uh, you know, at home and, and obviously at work. Yeah. One of the fallacies is that people think sustainability costs. And, you know, with my background in accounting, I'm not interested in anything that costs more. I'd rather have <laughs> something that costs less, right? Right. But if you do it right, uh, there's tremendous efficiencies and savings there. And what I would encourage your listeners to do, and whether it's at home or in your business or, or the hotel or the restaurant, is uh, start to benchmark the, your utility usage. So, if you can benchmark your utility usage, um, electricity, your water, your gas, uh, start tracking it and then 
get a group of your employees together and say, hey, this is what's going on. You know, our usage is up over last year or we've had some good savings. And then ask those employees uh, what they think they can do um, to initiate programs that'll make it more efficient. Because so often the, you know, the managers don't have the answer, but it's the plumber, it's the electrician, right. uh, it's the mechanical guys uh, or girls um, that have the answers. So um, I sat on a, um, a board and we, we got a grant um, through the IMLS, the uh, library services, and uh, we're starting to benchmark museums, zoos, aquariums all over the country so that we can start to institute uh, these type of savings programs. Okay. So you did, were the sustainability initiatives there before you arrived 11 years ago, or is this something that you've pushed since you've gotten there? Um, they had a, a green, print, green, green print committee that was set up, um, but I've really been able to develop it quite a, a bit more and uh, been able to do things like green roofs and, and rain gardens and uh, getting um, really our, our, all of our employees to focus on sustainability. And um, it's been very successful. We've, uh, uh, we've been able to keep our utility spend uh, flat for 10 years. And that's wow. even, even though we've grown uh, the, the attendance from a million to a million six. And we've also added um, quite a few new buildings, uh, large buildings, um, probably in the neighborhood of 150 to 200,000 square feet of buildings. And uh, utility costs have risen. And we've been able to keep our cost and our spend flat or reduced uh, just by doing some of the things that I've uh, previously mentioned. So um, that's pretty exciting. And the yeah. more exciting thing is um, just educating people in the community, you know, to be aware and telling them what they can do and um, really using the zoo as a demonstration model. We're the largest cultural attraction in Michigan. Um, in a normal pre-COVID year, we do a million and a half, a million 600,000 visitors. Uh, so it's a really busy, busy place and it's a good place to educate. So, so, you know, I, I, there's always a, a space for sustainability, right? Everybody understands the inherent value of sustainability. One of the questions I have, right, is that when you launch these sustainable initiatives, there's generally more work for people, right? There's, there, there's generally, uh, you know, ongoing work that's maybe a little bit more, a little bit different than what they were used to. How do you generate or create buy-in amongst your leaders and amongst your, your team? Uh, you know, to, to, you know, go after these sustainable initiatives besides just telling them it's going to be done? That's an excellent question, Chris. And um, I tell you, uh, the most success came after we got the buy-in. It wasn't when, you know, the C-suite or the, you know, executive level managers thought it was a good idea. Um, it didn't work until we were able to convince you know, the frontline staff that it was a good idea. And the way we went about that was we put together what we call the green team and um, met monthly and kind of divvied up responsibilities and set up some subcommittees, you know, so that we had like a recycling subcommittee, we had a utility usage subcommittee, um, we had an animal habitat subcommittee and uh, then the committees would come back and report out uh, monthly uh, as to what their progress was. And that's really when we started to make a lot of headway is um, when that green team started functioning efficiently. And um, food helps if you do it over lunch and buy pizza or <laughs> some sort of uh, food, it, that always helps. There's and, nothing wrong with bribing people. No. And, um, what we found too is the people that were voluntold didn't get to do very, you know, they didn't do very well. Right. People that were interested in it. And, and we always tried to make sure that it was um, total, totally voluntary and that people uh, were interested in the committee and it, and it wasn't something that was assigned to them. Awesome. Awesome. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, in listening to, to what you discussed here, right, you know, whether it's it's your career progression, whether it's 
initiatives you've, you've launched the zoo, the, the, the change in growth, uh, just even in the physical structure, uh, a lot of this has to be, uh, you know, driven by leadership and kind of the effectiveness of, of leadership. So, you know, how have you been able to translate uh, leading in a hotel or, or, or developing leaders in that setting to developing leaders in a zoo? I mean, is it, it, is it the same? Is there some transfer over? Is there things you've learned in your past you've been able to move over there or, or how's that worked out? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. I think um, it, it's, it's the same. I mean, it's the same all over. Um, and it really, really comes down to how you treat people and you know that the respect you give people um mr marriott had a saying you know that if you take care of your employees they'll take care of the guests and then we make money right right and i think this you know that same principle applies in life really so you know i guess for for my leadership style i kind of throw um leadership development into three buckets and it's a concern for employees uh, commitment to the guests and hands-on management. Um, so the concern for employees is, you know, I say, listen closely. Uh, if people care enough to speak, you need to listen and make sure you involve them in decisions that affect uh, the work that they do. You know, it kind of goes back to that uh, utility efficiency committee, you know, that invite the people that are doing that work and let them know that you truly listen. And then you need to empower the people to use their knowledge and their freedom and the flexibility they need to do the job that they do. And um, when they're doing it, make sure you encourage them and um, you make sure that you listen when they bring new ideas to you and that it's um, not just another meeting or you're looking on your cell phone when they're there talking to you. Um, you have to look them in the eye and make sure that, that they realize it's important to you. And then the old golden rule, you know, if you treat people uh, the way you'd like to be treated, um, and hopefully everyone likes to be treated well. I mean, nobody likes to be abused, I don't think. So <laughs> uh, if you treat people the way you want to be treated, things really work out pretty well. And then finally, um, ask them what their goals are. You know, every year when I do uh, reviews, I say, give me three goals. And I don't care if it's, you know, to lose weight or start exercising or become closer with your spouse it, you know it doesn't have to be job related right um, but that really lets people know that you care about people and then awesome. um, commitment to the guest you know when I first went to the zoo um, you know it'd been run by the city and it was kind of a governmental institution and you know I was trying to kind of privatize it if you will and I told the employees I said I only want you to do two things Cleanliness and friendliness, you know, right. and if the place is clean and you're friendly, when you screw up, because you will, uh, people give you another chance. Um, but if the bathrooms are dirty and there's paper laying around on the ground and the, the employees are surly, uh, they won't give you another chance. So cleanliness and friendliness. Um, in fact, one of my son's friends said it's the same thing he looks for in a girlfriend. You know? <laughs> so, it's, uh, you know, you don't have to look real far just to, to, to have the right, uh, you know, to have the right qualities in place and make sure that, that you're doing well. But listen, listen to your customers and get all the feedback you can. Um, get out there and talk to them. Right. You know, one thing I did at the zoo is 125 acres. And when I got there, they gave me the keys to a real fancy golf cart. And I said, go ahead and keep the keys. Give me a bike, you know. So I got a bike and I put my helmet on and every day, a couple times a day, I'd get around the zoo and, you know, people uh, seemed to be a lot more approachable when I was on the bike than in the golf cart. So I bet. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, inspect what you expect. You know, if you, if you expect the bathrooms to be clean, you know, we had, um, I don't know, 30 bathrooms we have at the zoo. So I'd try to get in each of them at least once a week and take a peek and, see see what's going on and then know what the competition's up to you know because your guests um entertainment dollars and the zoo business or their hospitality dollars um they're valuable and they can go anywhere and they walk with their feet um 
So just make sure you know what the, uh, the competitors are up to and then try to make it fun. You know, if you can make it fun, um, it makes it a lot more enjoyable for yourself and the employees catch on to that really quickly too. If, if you're a fun sort of person or if you're kind of crabby, so. Absolutely. And then that last bucket, hands-on management, you know, I always try to lead by example. Um, you know, in the zoo business, we we're busy on Saturdays and Sundays. So it didn't make much sense to be there on Monday through Friday if the busier days were on the weekends. So, right. you know, I always schedule myself uh, for weekend days and take Monday off or whatever, you know. Um, so often, you know, we get that martyr syndrome in hospitality where we think we have to be there all the time. <laughs> and you, you, you don't, you know, you, you need to have a good life work balance and, but you need to be there when the customers are there. Right. You know, if we had 10, 12,000 people on Saturday and 2000 on Monday, it didn't make much sense for me to be there on Monday. Um, but um, adjust your schedule and take care of yourself and your family too. Um, and part of leading by example too, is just showing respect. If you show respect, you're going to gain respect, communicate clearly, directly, timely, ask questions when you don't understand. Um, but, uh, you know, all those things are important. Uh, I think if you're able to praise people publicly and critique them in private, that works really well, but don't be afraid to give people constructive feedback. Uh, one thing I, I, I say a lot and I use very often is, um, can I give you some feedback? Mm -hmm. I've never had anyone tell me no. <laughs> okay. But it, it opens the door to them knowing that you're going to give some feedback and, right. you know, it may be critical and it may be a critique. Um, but it, it says that they'll allow it. And I think that's really important. So can I give you some feedback? Uh, works really well for me. And um, don't be afraid to listen to all kinds of diverse ideas. Okay, we're in a, a global environment now where there's lots of different people. Um, and you need to really be open to that and embrace change through diverse ideas, because it's sure not the same as it was when I started out with Marriott when they had 73 hotels. Um, include, you know, encourage diversity, inclusion, social justice. And um, one thing, you know, when you, when you look to hire people, hire for attitude, train for skill, because, right. you know, you can't instill a good attitude in someone that's crabby. Okay. Um, stay healthy, work hard, pay attention to the little details. Okay. On uh, the hotel business, I always said, if there aren't any cigarette butts uh, at the main entrance and the back dock is clean every day. Um, the things that happen in between sometimes just tend to take care of themselves, but people know you're watching. Okay. Yep. But if there's cigarette butts in the, in the front and the, the flowers are dead and the, 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 the walk-off mats are, are, are nasty. Um, you don't have, a very good chance that the rest of the place is going to be clean and well-maintained. Right. Um, but, you know, and again, manage your time. Um, if you believe in meditation or prayer, go ahead and pray and delegate people and hold them, hold them accountable and be smart with the time that you spend at your work. Love it. I like, I feel like you've, you've touched on every single piece of advice that like, smart hoteliers have always uh handed down there i feel like that's a a great rundown and 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 uh i i tried feverishly writing but i'm just gonna have to go back and listen to this again so <laughs> i uh, i got about half of it down i'm like i'm not gonna be able to keep up with this that's uh <laughs> but uh, i i appreciate that thank you very much that was uh was very concise and 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 you know very well thought out i i appreciate that jerry that was great well thank you chris absolutely you asked one thing though, in the beginning of the interview, and I'm just going to hit on it quickly. And that's, if there's one um, important attribute or skill that a promising hotel person or hospitality person should possess, what is it? And I got to say, it's humility. Um, this is a tough business, but there's really no room for egos. Um, 
or people that seem to think they know it all. Uh, if you're humble and you take feedback and you listen to customers closely, you'll do really well. And if um, not, you may be better off in IT or uh, some other business where it's not required. But the work we do is, um, it's very humbling. I mean, you know, we're cleaning toilets, making beds, um, serving people uh, food and keeping things clean. Um, but if you're able to do it with a humble attitude, you'll be really good at it. And if not, um, you're probably in the wrong line of work. I love it. I, you know, I, I we get advice all the time here and, and I appreciate you giving that. And I think, uh, you know, being humble is, uh, you know, one of those things where as a leader, you know, if you, if you go into all of this and you think that you are, you know, everything, or you're the smartest person in the room, uh, guarantee you one, you're not, uh, and, and, and two, you're going to miss the idea that, uh, gets you to where you need to be. Um, you know, so, so being humble and, and, you know, you can't listen if you're not humble, right? If you have no humility, you cannot listen. It doesn't matter if it's your, your team, the guest, your ownership, it, you're going to miss something. If you always uh, think you're the smartest person in the room. Yeah, that's for sure. Wow. Wow. That's great advice. You know, it, it's, it's funny because I don't even know how to pick out all of the advice here. I mean, like you, you've, you've given a, a great rundown here on leadership. So uh, I really hope that people get a chance to come back, listen to this a couple of times, you know, pull pieces out of this, uh, you know, to anybody who's listening, who's coming into the industry uh, or, or may have just been in for a couple of years, uh, you know, a lot of great stuff here. Hopefully you can come back, think about it, reflect on it, figure out how to implement it because, you know, you're spot on, uh, Jerry, in, in, in pretty much everything you said here. So thank you very much. Well, it's sure been my pleasure, Chris. And I really um, appreciate having a chance to get to know you and uh, hopefully uh, be able to help your listeners. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jerry, I, I think that's what we've got for today. Uh, that's our time for today. But uh, if people wanted to know more about the uh, the Detroit Zoo, where, where are they going to, to, to see more about the zoo? Uh, DetroitZoo.org. Just awesome. go to our website and um, we try to keep it updated. And um, also uh, Facebook and Instagram and um, uh, Twitter and all the social media outlets, you know, is that, that are so important now. Um, we do a lot of work with them as well. Perfect. Well, I'm sure if anybody has any questions about the sustainability uh, initiatives or any of the leadership advice, uh, they're going to be able to figure out a way to get a hold of you through there. So absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Just um, send me a message through the portal and I'm sure it'll get to me. Awesome. Well, Jerry, thank you very much. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to our paths crossing again in the future. So uh, have a great rest of your day. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris.